The uterus is located between the bladder and the urethra, ventrally, and the colon dorsally. Whereas the body of the uterus and the cervix are easily scanned transabdominally, the vaginal portion is generally inaccessible. The right and left uterine horns branch out of the uterine body cranially, tracing a winding path in the abdominal cavity and reaching the ventral lateral area beside the kidneys, where each ovary can be distinguished. The ovaries measure approximately 2 cm in length in dogs and 1 cm in cats, whereas the horns measure between 3 and 8 mm in thickness during an estrus. This makes them difficult to locate in certain dogs and especially in cats. Obviously, the size of the reproductive tract will vary depending on the estrus cycle and will be most easily detected during estrus. Note the proximity between the ovaries and kidneys. Identification of the kidneys is a good starting place to locate the ovaries, especially when the uterine horns are not large enough to be identified and followed cranially. Much like the scrotum and testicles, which can be easily evaluated with ultrasound, the prostate is generally accessible transabdominally, at least in part. A transrectal probe can also be used to complete the exam, especially if the prostate extends more deeply into the pelvic canal, or if a mass or cyst that extends into that canal is suspected. If the bladder is fully distended, the prostate will likely be pulled cranially, facilitating the examination. The right and left prostate lobes surround the proximal portion of the urethra and are usually distinguished. Whereas the prostate gland will be small and weakly echogenic in a castrated dog, the prostate in an intact male will be larger, more spherical, and hyperechoic. The normal prostatic lobes should be symmetrical and uniform in echotexture. However, in case of benign hyperplasia, small anechoic cysts may be recognized. A linear probe can be useful to evaluate the ovaries in uterus, as long as they're close enough to the body wall. Here we can see the left ovary with the adjacent kidney and spleen. The ovary is oval-shaped, slightly irregular, and with a non-uniform texture due to several fluid-filled and solid corpora luteae in this female in diestrus. The probe is gently moved caudally to identify the left uterine horn, and follow it toward the uterine body. This is not always easy to do, especially when the horn is small or when GI contents get in the way or if the patient is obese. All of these factors will limit visibility. Each horn is sinuous and will sometimes be difficult to distinguish from an intestinal loop. The intestinal walls are thicker and show peristaltic movement. The GI lumen often contains gas. The junction with the uterine body is not easy to see. Here, we can observe the bladder close by. It is filled with urine and located to the right of the caudal portion of the left uterine horn. A transverse plane makes it easier to identify the uterine body and cervix and to distinguish them from the descending colon and bladder. In this female dog at the beginning of diestrus, the cervical region is still obvious. The cervix is often shaped like a bullseye in a transverse plane. The colon and shadowy fecal matter are located to the left and dorsally whereas the flattened bladder neck is visible ventrally and to the left. By moving the probe cranially, the body of the uterus appears smaller compared to the cervix. In the longitudinal plane, we can see the inside folds of the cervix as well as the different wall layers of the uterus in early diestrus. These layers are more obvious in proestrus, estrus, midestrus, and at the start of diestrus, whereas they disappear later in a diestral phase and during an estrus. The same thing applies to the horns. After a thorough examination of the cervix and body, including measurements of the diameter of these portions, the probe is gently moved cranially toward the origin of the right horn, which is then followed cranially on the right side of the bladder. The horn is then followed toward the right ovary. Observe how the wall layers are relatively distinct, which is typical of the beginning of diestrus. The right ovary is finally located just behind the right kidney. It is oval-shaped and hypoechoic, measuring less than one centimeter in length in this dog. In male dogs, the prostate can be identified in the transverse plane at the neck of the bladder. The probe is moved caudally from the bladder neck to identify the small, bilobed structure that is moderately echogenic. 
In this young intact beagle, the prostate surrounds the urethra that contains a small amount of anechoic urine. Note that the urethral wall blends into the tissue of the prostate. A convex probe is generally more useful due to its smaller footprint that can be more easily moved around and pointed toward the pelvic canal. A linear probe can sometimes be used in certain patients, especially if its footprint area isn't too long and the prostate is located cranially. The probe is moved from caudal to cranial to view the entire prostate, examining at the same time the prostatic urethra and the bladder neck. In the longitudinal plane, we can see the oval or fusiform shape of the normal prostate, as well as the lumen of the urethra passing through it. The colon and the fecal matter it contains create a blurry shadow along with reverberation, which can be identified dorsal to the bladder and slightly cranially. In major intact dogs, the prostate is enlarged due to the influence of testosterone. Prostate hyperplasia causes symmetrical increase in the volume of both lobes along with uniform hyperechogenicity. Small anechoic cysts may also appear. Note here the smooth contours of the prostatic lobes and how they are easily distinguished from the surrounding fat. This clear distinction will often be lost when the prostate is inflamed or develops a tumor. The lobes appear slightly asymmetrical, but this is due to the oblique angle used to evaluate the prostate in this dog. Observe also the acoustic shadow extending from the center of the prostate, which is explained partly by the presence of the round urethra and partly by a phenomenon of refraction. In the sagittal plane, the enlarged prostate extends beyond the scanned surface. Its caudal portion disappears in the acoustic shadowing caused by the pubic bone. The prostatic urethra is visible as an ill-defined hypoechoic band in the center of the prostate. 